Welcome to uh, the University of Tasmania's MS flagship research connection. Research Research for Connection. Let me start that again. Welcome to the University of Tasmania, Menzies Re Medical Research Institute, MS flagship research with connections symposium. We've got to shorten that. <laughs> <laughs> Great to see uh, so many friends here uh, and, and familiar faces and, and also some new faces who will, um, I hope, leave as friends. Uh, my name is Des Graham and I have the privilege of being the chair of the Consumer and Community Engagement Committee uh, for the Menzies uh, within the MS flagship. So it's great uh, to be back at this thing to see this. It's a, it's a highlight in my calendar uh, and I know that this symposium is becoming iconic. Um, I've got some uh, housekeeping matters that we need to go through, but um, I thought we might uh, start by introducing ourselves. Um, Interesting, and I'll tell you a little story. Rowan and I, Rowan, uh, can you stand up? Where are you, Rowan? Rowan, uh, this is uh, Rowan Greenland. He's our, the CEO of MS Australia. So, very important character. If you get an opportunity, um, introduce yourself to Rowan. Uh, Rowan and I uh, went to the UK recently and we uh, were essentially trying to sell the May 50K to the world. And so uh, basically what we want to do is we want to license the May 50K uh, to other countries, they'll raise money, we'll get a percentage of that, and then we'll go into research. So essentially what we're trying to do is maintain an in, uh, a steady income for research in Australia. Um, but while I was there, I also took the opportunity to go and meet uh, with some other people. I went to the Scottish Carers Association and I went to the MS, um, uh, what they call the MS Scottish Council, because they actually belong to the MS Society of UK, but they have a, their own council. So I went up to there and um, my grandfather migrated from uh, Scotland when he was about 10. And so I actually met some family up there, which was great. And I was just coming back through the door, and, and I'm still a little jet lag, but a uh, very kind friend said to me, you look a bit tired, Des. And I was, like last night, I had the best sleep that I've had since I came back, I came back on Saturday. And I said to him, I think it's the weight. I put on four kilos in three weeks. It's amazing. Huh? And I did have a few too many drams of uh, the good whiskey. Uh, and I ate like hags, but you know what the killer was? The killer was, the battered Mars bars. And if you've never had a deep fried Mars bar, you're missing out on something very special. <laughs> when I had the first one, <laughs> when, when I had the first one, uh, you know, it's, it's like a traditional dish, you've got to have a Mars bar. So when I had the first one, they, it, it comes, it's wrapped up in fish and chip paper and they give it to you and they say, it's hot. You know, no one sort of say, wait a few minutes. And so I had a few minutes and, you know, when you put something hot in your mouth and it's you know, you can roll it around and, uh, and you roll it around, you, you cool it down. Let me tell you, when you bite into a mar bar that's hot, it sticks to your teeth, it sticks to your gum. And I was doing this. <laughs> My wife said, she had to walk away. She said, you look like you're doing a Scottish jig. It was bloody awful. But this the bad Mars bar, deep fried, fantastic. So get hold of those. Um, so that's a little bit about me. So, so um, I know that I say this every time and uh, most of you are aware, but I do have a speech problem because I am a person living with MS. It affects my articulation and also a little bit of my recall. So if, uh, if I'm talking and I've got a short uh, period, but it feels like minutes to me that I have a hesitation in my speech. It's, it's really seconds to people tell me. So just wait with me and, and if it gets too long, Mr. Potter will come up and slap me in the back of the head and it'll reset me and away I'll go. So it'll all work. Um, so uh, that's me. Um, I was wondering if we could, if you're willing, just put your hands up if you're a consumer and or a carer. So I can see where you are. Absolutely awesome. Awesome. Service providers? <coughs> Excellent. 
big group of them over here, so let's, let's keep an eye on them. Um, and researchers. Excellent. So what we've got is a fantastic mix, and it's great to see so many people from MSL. So thank you, MSL, for uh, for allowing uh, many of your staff to come. So that's much appreciated. Um, so we've got a fantastic mix, which means the purpose of this symposium is around connections. And because we've got such a good mix here, we can have a very good symposium, or we can have a great symposium. And the way you have a great symposium is you talk to each other and you introduce each other uh, over like morning tea, uh, over lunch, but you also ask questions. And so you're amongst friends. There's no silly questions. And I heard some of the presenters talking this morning and they're, they're a little nervous. My advice to you is this is a coffee discussion. This is like having coffee at home with your friends. And so please don't be nervous. And if you're a participant and you've got a question, please put your hand up and we'll try and get as many of those uh, answered as we can. And if you can't answer it, you run out of time, we'll make sure you get the, get the answer in due course. So, thank you for that. I know where you are. Uh, now, I've got to run through some house fitting matters here. That's about, about 20 years ago, I did, a, uh, I did a media training course with Norman Swan, so now famous ABC reporter. And, uh, and you talk, you, know, you, you learn about how to present uh, on TV and how to do a media uh, interview, etc., etc., and also how to be an MC. And so I got normally go give you individual feedback because it's all about the individual. And um, he gave me good feedback in terms of TV and radio. And he basically said, "Dees, you're hopeless at MC. So um, make sure you take lots of paper that looks really disorganised." And then if you deliver, then you look wonderful because when you stand up and you've got all these bits of paper, you said you look terrible. He said there's no confidence in you at all. So bear with me because I have got lots of paper, um, but they're all meaningful. Uh, one of the things I always like to do because uh, towards the end of the day, we, we start to lose people, planes, etc. So So um, I always like to acknowledge the people who, who put in hard work to get us here today and to make this event uh, which is so special to, to all of us, uh, happened. And I know there was lots of people from the University of Tasmania and from Menzies in particular uh, who worked very hard, and, and I understand there were some people, particularly in the north. But I was wondering whether, uh, in particular, we could ask Tash, Viv, Rosie and Rachel to stand up. Without you, we wouldn't be here. So, so thank you very much to all of you. Uh, and thank you, Viv, for these long list of dot points I've got. So, uh, phones. Phones, are, uh, if you put them on silent, please. Uh, you don't have to turn them off. But if you do answer them, if you could exit the room, that would be great. Um, we've got two sessions today. There'll be six sessions in the morning and five sessions after lunch. Lunch will be at 12.30 uh, in we're aiming for a return about 1.15. Now we're going to play with that a little bit in terms of our time, but that's what's scheduled at the moment. Uh, feel free to pick up your lunch and then bring it back in here and, and eat it in here. Uh, there are a number of tray tables which are situated out the front, so it's great to see the tray tables. And, and again, this is all about connection, so make sure you introduce yourself to those tables, get some information from them, uh, the, the importance of uh, being involved in research is critically important um, because at the end of the day, you know, we've got expert researchers, but the people and the carers we, who have got MS are actually MS experts. And so we need to make sure, as people living with MS and people who care for us, that the researchers have the information that they require to actually deliver the cure and better treatments for us. So really important to engage with those trade tables and, and have a conversation with them. Um, toilets, toilets are out the door to the right, uh, and then another right, there's uh, accessible toilet there, uh, men's and women's, and then also another set of toilets through the, uh, through the restaurant, uh, straight through the restaurant to the back. Um, 
We do need to take COVID protection, so if you can continue to wear your masks, that would be great, um, and take them off, uh, obviously, when you need to. Um, and that's about it. So I will come back shortly, but uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Nicholas Blackburn, who's going to welcome the country. Morning, everyone. Today, we are meeting on Lutruwitza, Tasmania, Aboriginal land, seas and waterways. I acknowledge with deep respect the traditional owners of the land, the Palawa people, which we meet today. The Palawa people belong to the oldest continuing culture in the world. They cared and protected country for thousands of years. They knew this land, they lived on this land, and they died on these lands. I honour them. For many years, the Palawa people referred to this land as the Palawina Lurini Kanamaluka, meaning the town near the River Tamar. I acknowledge that it is a privilege to stand on country and walk in the footsteps of those before us, along the riverbanks, among the gums and seas, and continue to run through the veins of the Tasmanian Aboriginal community. I pay my respects to Elders past and present and to the many Aboriginal people that did not make Elder status and to the Tasmanian Aboriginal community that continue to care for country and a particular welcome to any in that community that are here today. I recognise a history of truth which acknowledges the impacts of invasion and colonisation upon Aboriginal people resulting in the forcible removal from their lands. Our island is deeply unique with spectacular landscapes with our cities and towns surrounded by bushland, wilderness, mountain ranges and beaches. I stand for a future that profoundly respects and acknowledges Aboriginal perspectives, culture, language and history, and a continued effort to fight for Aboriginal justice and rights, paving the way for a strong future. Thank you very much, Des, and thank you very much for your commitment to making this event happen. Um, I've had an opportunity to get around and meet some of you today. For those of you I haven't, I hope you have a wonderful day. And um, I, I, unfortunately, I'll apologise up front that I won't be able to stay for the day. And before I go into what I do wish to say today, I just want to also acknowledge and congratulate MS Australia, who have today been awarded a global award for their MS Brain Health Program. It's amazing. So congratulations. And further to that, we also have in our presence an MS nurse who has also won the Global Award for that program, Jodie Hudson from Victoria. So well done, Jodie. Thank you. So I'm so excited to see so many people here today and would like to extend a very warm welcome to each of you, particularly those of you who have travelled from around the state and, inter and from interstate. It's very special to have you all here. I'd also like to acknowledge um, the CEO of MS Australia, Ronald Greenland, my friends Andrew Giles and Andrew Potter who always keep me in touch with what's going on with MS Australia, uh, Leone Duff who will be speaking to us about her lived experience with MS, members of the MS Flagships Consumer and Community Reference Committee, MS researchers and students from the University of Tasmania and the Menzies Institute for Medical Research, staff from MS Limited, Tasmania and Victoria, and importantly, most importantly, people living with MS and their families, friends and carers, who are what this event is all about. It is indeed an honour to be here today to open the MS Research flagship event, celebrating the power of connection. I have huge respect for the incredible work the Menzies Institute for Medical Research does for people with MS. I also have a personal connection to MS, so the opportunity to speak to you today has extra significance. My eldest brother, Peter Bushby, who is here with us today, was diagnosed with MS in 1979 as a young, recently married man. Peter and his family have made many changes and adjustments to their lives over the past four decades, but this neurological disorder did not stop him from enjoying a full career in real estate and being a doting father and grandfather. I've watched Peter negotiate and adapt to his primary progressive MS since his early 20s, prompting me to actively support and advocate for research in my role as a senator. Together with New South Wales Labor Senator Deborah O'Neill, I co-chair the Parliamentary Friends of Multiple Sclerosis Group, 
which allows us to share insights about MS and research breakthroughs with our parliamentary colleagues. Not only does this group give us a chance to share all the good work being done by organisations like Menzies with our colleagues in Canberra, but it means that I also get insights into upcoming research ideas and treatments. And that is exciting because there is so much good work going on in this space, and you will hear a lot about that today. World MS Day will be marked on Monday here in Tasmania, around Australia, and across the world. This is the third year of the World MS Day global theme of connections, which started in 2020 when we were all grappling to understand the impacts of coronavirus. The idea of connection is far reaching, and something that became extremely relevant as we dealt with the effects of the pandemic. As the global campaign has shown us during 2020, 2021, and now into 2022, the idea of connection is vital for those living with MS. Connection involves connecting with yourself, your feelings and your symptoms, connecting with others in your community with MS, as well as carers, family, friends and medical professionals, and connecting with those providing the quality care for people living with MS and the therapies that work for you personally. I know just what a difference connection makes for Peter. I understand the challenges MS presents can leave those living with the condition feeling lonely and socially isolated. I know how important connection is for his wellbeing Living close by, I see him frequently, dropping in to share a coffee or a meal with his, him and his wife, Debbie, who's also here today. As a family, we have joined with Peter's friends to form teams at events like the MS Walk, Run and Roll and raise money and awareness for MS research. Unfortunately, we can't be there on Sunday because we have other commitments, but I hope it goes well and it doesn't pour with rain like it did last year. Um, MS connects us and it drives us. Australia's focus for World MS Day next week is on employment and MS, which links to the connection theme via community. I know Peter valued his long-term involvement in the real estate sector and credits his role with keeping him active through his working life. With this in mind, I'm looking forward to the launch of MS Australia's survey on employment and MS on Monday, and the insights it will uncover to make it easier for people like Peter to work with MS. Another reason for my interest in advocating for MS research is that Tasmania has the highest prevalence of MS in Australia. Tasmania's rate is around double that of Queensland, which correlates with our knowledge that MS prevalence increases the further people live away from the equator. This fact is something that impacts thousands of Tasmanians and has far-reaching impacts for our state's health and allied services. What buoys me is the knowledge that people who are diagnosed with this disorder are now benefiting from the remarkable progress that has been made in research, MS research over the past few decades. When Peter was diagnosed 43 years ago, there was no treatment options and all he could do was manage the condition and learn to live with his MS. But now we have disease modifying therapies or immunotherapies which reduce disease activity in the central nervous system and reduce the frequency and severity of relapses for people with MS. Such treatments mean people who are diagnosed with MS today can hold off disability and keep well for the longer term. Indeed, MS Research Australia's Head of Research, Dr Moran, Julia Moran, told us at last year's World MS Day Parliamentary Breakfast in Canberra that the inroads that have been made through research means we can effectively stop MS in its tracks. This research means people are diagnosed with MS earlier now but disability milestones are reached later and the number of hospitalisations are down. We know about a number of environmental factors that present as precursors to multiple sclerosis, including past and recent sun exposure and vitamin D levels, viral infections, chemical ex exposures, diet and genetic factors. And the important Australian MS longitudinal study gives us a greater understanding of the condition. This survey is a partnership between MS Research Australia and the Menzies Institute and has been running for more than 20 years. Thousands of Australians, including Peter I think, complete annual surveys to provide real life data about MS that can be used to inform the need for medical and support services for those with MS and their families and carers. 
and software has been developed to monitor changes in symptoms between the annual longitudinal study surveys, so we are able to respond to the data presented more responsively than ever. Research done here by our Australian experts has changed the lives of people with MS around the world. We hope that research will lead to more and better therapies or the ability to reverse the damage this condition has caused. But most importantly, we one day hope there will be a cure for MS. When I return to the new parliament, new parliament in the coming weeks, actually to, oh, this next week I'm heading up there, I will continue working to advocate for better services and investment in MS research through the Parliamentary Friends Group. I hope that you all have an enjoyable day today and take the opportunity to connect with those around you. Thank you very much. All right, I'd love to talk to you about uh, our research journey of employment. Um, we've done a lot of work on that. Uh, I'd love to show you little snippets of some of the publications that we've published and what that has led to in terms of changing the lives of people with MS. Um, so I'm the project director of the Australian MS Longitudinal Study, as Wendy mentioned. Um, it, it's been going since 2002. I took over the reins in 2014 from Rex Simmons. Um, and since then, we've done some beautiful work, continued his work on employment. He started it back then, and I've continued that, that, that component. Um, when we talk about working or not working, um, work gives a lot of connections. Um, and it also provides financial security, uh, gives us a sense of identity, uh, purpose. It's a reason to get up, get up in the morning. It gives us enjoyment, socialization, and also that feeling of benefit to others. But of course, as a person with MS, that comes with increasing with, with, with challenges. Um, how do you manage all of that uh, when you have all of these symptoms? Often they're invisible, sometimes they're visible, uh, sometimes the workplace needs to be adjusted. Uh, it's challenging. So there's some positive statistics. Um, we published that a couple of years ago. It's a paper that we call Closing the Gap. Um, we basically showed that employment rates have increased over time. So in 2010, 48% uh, of people with MS were employed versus 63% in the general population. But a couple of years later, that already had gone down substantially. 57% was employed and 60, compared to 61 in the general population. So you can see that that gap is closing. Um, and uh, that, that is incredibly important and the gap was even smaller for women than it was for men. Um, next year we're hoping to repeat this analysis and see whether we've gone even further with that. Age of retirement has increased. 51 was the age of retirement for people with MS in 2007 and that increased to 57 in 2013. So a beautiful increase. Also, that more people are returning to work. So 4.6% in 2007 returned to work and 9.7% in 2013. So a nice success story. So of course you wonder why, why would that be? Um, effective therapies. The disease modifying therapies have made a, a huge impact. And, and we published one paper where we could show that. Um, you can see with the diagram that Yes. Um, we've categorised the, the disease-modifying therapies in the, the original injectable uh, um, therapies. And these are, this is 2010 and it's gone down to 2015. But if you look at the category three, 2 and 3 immunotherapies, which are a lot more effective, but also have a higher risk profile associated with them, you see that they have substantially increased between the period of 2010 and 2015. Now, where we ask people about their perceptions um, and about their work attendance and productivity, um, they basically told, told us that the people who used the most effective disease-modifying therapies 
they were two to three times more likely to report an increased amount of work, an increased work attendance, and an increased work productivity compared to people who used the injectable therapies. And this work was done based on data from 2015, and not all the disease modifying in, in, in this in, in between 2015 and now there would have been more uh, disease modifying therapies available. But the ones that had the largest effect sizes were fingolimod and atalizumab. So that's really good to see. And we've done some more work on that where we looked more longitudinally rather than cross-sectionally. Um, and this was work that was commissioned by Biogen um, and they um, are the ones who bring up atalizumab. Um, and when we did a very thorough analysis, a longitudinal analysis, we looked at 23 different um, what we call patient reported outcomes, um, basically ranging from severity in symptoms, 13 different types of symptoms, their overall quality of life, their employment status, their disability level. And out of all of those 23 outcomes, Natalizumab was basically provided superior effects compared to any other DMT. So we grouped all the other DMTs together and we also did very specific analysis where we looked at um, one treatment versus another. Here is the example of employment, employment, uh, sorry, work productivity loss. So what you can see here in the blue is that the work productivity loss has decreased over a two year period for the people who were using metalizumab. And for those who used another disease modifying therapy, that work productivity loss had increased a little bit. And this difference was significant. So we did a similar analysis for all of these outcomes um, it resulted in a report of about 60 pages, um, but I've just summarized one little snippet out of that, that big report. But again, it shows that the highly effective disease modifying therapies have a positive influence over time on work outcomes. In terms of work productivity loss, overall, we, we look at two different things. Absenteeism is when you literally cannot go to work for a particular reason. And out of the people, um, uh, all of the people who were working, about 18% said that they had any absenteeism in the last four weeks. And on average, it was 0.6 days. So not massive, but still, substantial. The other thing we looked at is presenteeism. So you go to work, but you're not feeling great, so your productivity is not as good as it, good as it, as it should be. So 52% reported to have any presenteeism, and on average this was 1.9 days less um, than, than full work productivity. So then if we ask the question about what, what drives the productivity loss, what are sort of the main factors? Of course, some of this is not surprising to a person with MS. Um, but the key thing for us was to, to really work out what are the symptoms that have most impact. And these are our top four. Top four. Um, we asked for 30 symptoms, but a lot of symptoms sort of clustered together and are correlated with each other. So we grouped them together according to those clusters. So the top one was fatigue and cognitive symptoms. Second one, pain and sensory symptoms have a big impact on work productivity loss. Difficulties with walking balance and spasticity, as well as feelings of anxiety and depression. So they were the ones that came out uh, to, to be most strongly associated with work productivity loss. We also looked at factors in the sort of the work environment. Uh, we looked at psychological safety, how safe do you feel to report that you have MS, to ask for assistance. 
uh, were asked about uh, the work difficulties that they had, the challenges that they had in the workplace. Um, and out of all of those, the ones that came out uh, were self-esteem at work is actually incredibly important. And you can imagine if you live with a disease like this that your self-esteem gets knocked around a bit. Um, that also has influence in the confidence of performing, performing your work activities. Uh, incredibly important. And also, I end up with some challenging work relationships. Um, with those increasing symptoms, you need to communicate your MS in the workplace. You might get some challenges, challenging scenarios. So there were other factors that were also associated with work productivity loss. The next thing we did, if we looked at change in work productivity. So, Overall, what you see here, we, we basically did an analysis where we, where we had the computer work out in which group people were falling. So at the top we have the people who have sort of a full work productivity. They're at 100%. And this is a group that has mild work productivity loss and these ones have a moderate work productivity loss. But what you can see overall they're pretty flat lines. This is over time, from 2015 to 2019, and it doesn't change much over time. These are pretty flat lines, which is incredibly positive. But that is at a group level, and you might wonder what that looked like, looks like at the individual level. It's more like this. So that's a little bit more messy, and as we know, life is a bit more messy than, than just nice, pretty graphs that, that, that you can see here at the top. So. Even at the people who have full work productivity, you know, it fluctuates a bit. And for the other people, you can see substantial fluctuations. We've only measured it from year to year. So there might be more fluctuations from day to day, from month to month. And when we looked at this a bit further, um, we actually found that in order in terms of maintaining your work productivity and, and what drives change in work productivity loss, it was a change in symptoms. So the similar symptoms came up, but it was that the change in symptoms drove the change in work productivity loss, but not so much the absolute level. So it didn't matter so much where you were on the scale. If you were able to control your symptoms and keep them steady, you're in a much better position. So my recommendations to maximize um, work productivity. I'm not very responsive, this little thing. Which way do I need to focus? I don't know where the machine is, though. actually. <laughs> Come on. Anybody know? Where should I focus? There? Keep using your prescribed disease modifying therapies. Probably not surprising. Hello? Yes. Manage your symptoms well. So the stabilization of symptoms, as I was talking, talking about before. And of course, improve them if it's possible. Work with your team. Work with your... Uh, team of health professionals to, to do that as well as possible, but also self-management, incredibly important. Improve work, workplace relationships, so communicate effectively in the workplace, incredibly important. Um, teaching yourself to communicate well or, or learning from others how to do that is, is very useful. And maintain confidence in performing your work activities. So consider modifications to your work demands or consider modifications of your work environments. What can you do yourself to, uh, uh, to improve those things? So to put all of this together, we basically created an online course called MS Work Smart. And it has nine modules where we run through symptom management, to communication around MS in the workplace, to your colleagues, to your employer. Talk about disclosure. What do you disclose? When do you disclose? How much do you disclose? Etc. Um, we talk about your thoughts, how your thoughts have impact on your actions and how you can modify some of the thoughts that you have. 
Um, also, how can you manage all your stress? You stress outside the workplace, within the workplace, and how can you modify your work environment? So this online course, um, we've just put it together. It's all gone to ethics. So we're now going to do a couple of studies to work out that it really is helpful for people with MS. Um, but here, uh, I thought I had one more slide on this. Yeah, there it is. Um, so basically we use text, images, hypothetical examples, quotes, tips, we have videos that you can learn from peers and experts, we have quizzes for self-insight and we have tasks to assist with implementing the learnings into practice. So really aiming to assist people with MS who, who are working um, as best as possible. As, alongside that, we are using a symptoms app. Um, this is an app that I have developed where you can track symptoms, but you can also track, track some of the behaviours that you have or the things that you might like to change. And then um, you can graph that all together in, in one, one visualisation to work out whether there are particular patterns. You can also track your medications to see whether any of the, the medications that you're using or whether an increase in dose, whether it works better or worse, etc. Um, so this symptom tracker will uh, be used alongside MS WorkSmart, but we will also be using them for other research. And once we feel that it works really well, we ho hopefully will throw that out um, to everybody to use. So, if you want to get involved, um, Australian MS Longitudinal Study, if you haven't signed up, please do. It's incredibly valuable, incredibly useful, uh, and we're hoping that all the research that comes out, out of it will actually be of benefit to you at some point in time. Um, you can consider providing feedback on MS WorkSmart. It's not out in the open yet, but um, we are calling, we've asked, we've asked some people to provide feedback, so these people are going through each of the modules and tell us how, uh, what they think of it and whether we've forgotten particular things. Same with the My Symptoms app, um, you can register your interest at the trade tables. Um, and of course, if you get an invitation to participate in MS WorkSmart as part of the, uh, our feasibility study or, or our randomised controlled trial, please consider participating. Of course, all of this can't happen. As you can see, massive number of people. Um, also, the project funding, MS Australia, is, has been fantastic uh, with supporting the Australian MS Longitudinal Study for such a long time. So I definitely want to thank them. So thank you very much for listening. I was diagnosed with MS. I reckon it would be, I was trying to figure it out, it was in the year that two of my children announced that they were going to get married and that I had to cater for one of the weddings. And I had two engage, uh, engagement parties and an 18th and a 21st. And, and at the end of that year, I thought, wow, I actually managed to get through it. And then, bang, <laughs> I was diagnosed with MS. But I suspected that I had it back in my 20s. Um, and that, it, you know, they say you go into remission when you're pregnant, and that probably helped. Okay, so um, I, um, my early life um, was, I was trained in music, but I've always had a great love for the visual arts. And um, I've had the most incredible journey, and I see MS as actually part of that, because I think it actually trains you to learn to deal with life um, as a bit of a race, a challenge. And I, when I was a kid, I used to love the 100 metre dash. I was quite good at sprinting, but whenever it came to the long distance haul, I'd get stitched and I'd lay down there and feel really sorry for myself and think, I can't do this, too much pain. But um, I've realised that actually life is more like the long distance race than it is like the short dash. You get the glory and it's all over and bang, but um, this is actually much harder. So um, I, I think um, for me, becoming a visual artist, I realised um, it was before I was diagnosed with MS and I actually took up art. We'd been through a huge financial crash as a family 
moved to the country. My friends and family built me a beautiful studio with a wood heater in it. And I'd go out there when all the kids had gone to bed and set about training myself in a disciplined way, like you have to do in the music world, where you actually learn how to do something really well, can't get away with any mistakes, you've got to do it well. So I studied the old masters. My husband was doing a, a degree through Deakin University online, so I borrowed from Deakin. 10, ten books on art, and he borrowed two on computing. And, um, and I, so I studied the whole history of art and its application to me as a painter. And so also, um, I think I realised I was actually not so much interested in creating gorgeous paintings that go with your couch, you know, the designer piece. I wanted to create paintings that said something, said something about my life and about generally the human condition, the human experience. So my paintings are more an expression of what I'd call visual poetry than they are um, designer pieces, let's put it that way. I'd probably be a lot wealthier if they were designer pieces, but anyway, that's it really. Okay, so I see, um, what I've really found is that in the race that you have to run, getting MES is like being given some weights training in the race. So it's already uphill with MS, and then somebody comes along and says, okay, now take this, see if you can keep going. And for me, um, this, this painting that you're looking at here is just, um, it's, not, it's not me physically, obviously, but I, if I see a gorgeous girl with the right coloured hair, and if the light's gonna go through her hair, it's gonna look fabulous and all that sort of thing. Um, it's actually um, just the feeling of that moment in the day where the busyness of breakfast is over and you're looking out the window and you're thinking, okay, what now? And you have to make a decision. Do you keep going or do you sort of slump down into self-pity and, you know, can't do this, all too hard. And I think um, that, what I call, you know, sort of a threshold where you have to make a decision to keep going and to do it with courage and grace and to be outward looking rather than inward looking is, is probably the biggest thing I've learned. So to, to run the, the long distance rather than the, the short race. Okay, so it's moving on. Right, so as things have evolved from my little studio in the country, I started entering my work in a few uh, major exhibitions and living in Herrick, which has got 12 houses and you know, the 36 people and half of them were ours. You know, I think, um, I thought to myself, if I'm going to build a, a, an art career that's going to actually help the family, help me, I loved painting. When I was doing it, it was like taking an absolute holiday. Um, I um, decided that I'd enter things that were on the mainland because you don't get recognised locally unless you could be, you know, noticed somewhere else. <laughs> so that's just the way it works. So, so I'd enter things on the mainland, won a few prizes, and then the local newspapers and stuff said, oh, Leone's, Leone's an artist, you know, so it started, it actually began. And I think you have to keep your standard very high, personally, always, to sort of, you know, you have to have a consistency in what you do. And so now, I, having moved in, back into Launceston, I run a little art school, and um, from that position, I have, uh, in the way it's worked out, I, don't, I actually don't credit it to myself. I actually think it's the most incredible gift, in a way. So I, I um, have had the opportunity to, to teach hundreds and hundreds of people that come through my studio, having been given the burden, that extra weight training of MS, means that you can look at other people with great empathy, and when they come through the door, may not be MS they're battling with, but they're battling with something. And that when they start painting, you encourage them, get them on the journey, they're doing something very positive. You give them the hope, yes, you can be a painter, it's just a skill, you, you can learn it, okay? You know, to actually be able to really communicate ideas requires the person, not, not so much the skill, okay? So you actually have to really commit to communicating something worthwhile. So as the people come through, they come from all walks of life, people who've given up smoking to have enough money to do art lessons, um, people who are professionals who have 
retired and how now want to learn how to paint. They've always wanted to learn how to paint. Um, they become regulars. Um, I thought to myself, well, I wonder if they'd be interested in going overseas together. Um, so I said, what about we go to Italy and have a look at Italian art history? You know, go to the Uffizi and all those wonderful places. And they said, yeah, sure. And so I said, okay, <laughs> organised it and off we went. Um, the, the, uh, we went to France the second time, so we went to the Louvre and all those sort of things. Um, while I was in France, I handed my card to a guy in the Pastel Museum of France. When I got home, they invited me to go back as a guest of honour for the International Pastel Exhibition. I thought, wow. And then I said to my husband, I can't do it. I, I couldn't go over there for six weeks by myself and just, you know, couldn't do it. The MS Society heard about it, offered me the Go For Gold Scholarship, which paid for my husband to come, who was my support through that whole thing, he always is. And, um, and so, you know, what an incredible opportunity. Following year, we went to Spain and Portugal, and all these people love the art history. All of it puts out in front of them our whole culture, everything that we've learned as people. And every painting is a kind of a discussion of the human condition. So to me, I think it's just the most incredible privilege. So when they come in, I teach them how to paint, I teach them the skills, and I teach them to have hope. Because I think that's what it's really all about. So when I'm in my studio by myself, I really value alone time. I love the community that's created by the art. I bring in tutors from all over the world and they run workshops in my studio. I facilitate others with teaching, but I love the time by myself because this is where my experience as a person can be actually um, translated into some sort of visual poetry, is how I'd call it. Okay, so I'm always trying to think, you know, what am I feeling now? Sometimes it's anger, you know. Wow, my best paintings are done when I'm really mad. Okay, and, and sometimes it's, okay, just that feeling of, like I was saying, at, at a crossroads, do you keep going or do you give up? Um, and so for me, art is therapy. It's actually the way I deal with life. Um, art is capable of saying things that are unspeakable. Okay, so that to me is really important, just to get that across. So <sighs> these are a couple of my paintings. I've only chosen a couple, but um, the one on the um, right was a finalist in the Glover a few years back. and. Um, the Glover's a landscape prize, so I always think to myself, well, you know, you have to think outside the box. <laughs> I'll, I'll put the washing on the line. Um, and I called the painting Horizon Line because I just wanted to, to say that, you know, you're looking out. You know, there's a history there. That I put some smoke in the distant hills. This is down in Falmouth. There's a history there of, of the original Palawa people, you know, sort of being on the coast, running their families, living an ordinary life. And then you have me with my family. And you know, I don't think I'm a great washerwoman actually, but I love the look of fresh washing on the line and the, the smell and the resonance of the light of it. And so it's actually, it's about from inside me more than it is the landscape, okay? So, and the painting on the left is two of my granddaughters, beautiful identical twin girls um, that been through, through some big things and it was for me to deal with it and also for them to have something that acknowledged the pain they'd been through. And I called the painting Divided We Stand, you know. And so, you know, to that, to the whole business of art, I actually think for people to take up something creative, something really positive to do, is going to be the best thing you can do because you have to keep going. You know, if you stop, you actually just fall into a bog of self-pity which creates more of the same. So you actually have to keep pressing on and art is one of the best ways that I have found to do that. So thank you. So when we respond to that, who am I question, the typical ways that we answer it is a reflection of our self-concepts. I am smart, I am funny, I'm quiet, I'm hardworking. 
These are all examples of our self-concepts. And we form these definitions of ourselves based on our roles, both at home, with our families, as well as at work. And as we enter adulthood, the answers we give to that who am I question start to become relatively consistent. We know who we are. However, some key life events can change our views of self. And these include changes due to ageing, as well as establishment of key life roles, such as becoming someone's spouse or starting a new career. But these things are almost predictable. We know when we reach a certain age, we will retire and leave work. We know when we're going to get married and we agree to start a new career. Another event that can change our self-concepts is receiving a medical diagnosis. And this is unique because it's often unexpected and we have no control over it. And some recent work has suggested that self-concept may be a relevant indicator of adjustment following medical diagnoses. And this is because who we see ourselves as impacts almost everything we do and how we feel. So why do we want to know about self-concept and how self-concept might change due to MS? Well, we know that self-concept is related to how people function in their everyday life, as well as their well-being. And we know this from studies in other clinical groups, such as individuals who have experienced a stroke. And it may be that MS alters the way you see yourself in your important everyday roles. And we know that roles do change due to MS, for example, some people have difficulties maintaining full-time work and managing personal commitments. But we do not have a good appreciation of how perceptions of oneself change as a result of MS. So to gain an understanding of how people living with MS may experience changes in their self-concept, we looked at all previous studies that have investigated this. And in total, 30 studies had ex explored this idea of how people living with MS may experience changes in their self-concept. And across these studies, data from over 1,500 people living with MS was available. So what did they find? Some of these studies found relationships between change in self-concept and other key factors. For example, self-concept change was related to greater number and severity of symptoms, withdrawal or changes to previously valued roles such as work roles, family roles and social roles was also related to greater self-concept change. And importantly, these studies also demonstrated the link between worsening self-concept and worse well-being over time. Other studies looked at how people living with MS spoke about changes to their self-concepts. And when we looked at these, we noticed that self-concept change was discussed both broadly, for example, I have completely changed as a person, as well as in more specific ways. For example, I am more of a reserved person now. There was also some descriptions of change in terms of loss of self. For instance, parts of the person I once was are now gone. And to extend on what these other studies had done and to get a better understanding of how self-concept change may be relevant to those living with MS, we then conducted our own research where we spoke to 16 people living with MS and ask them about their experiences of self-concept change. What this looked like, how it occurred, and the impact it had on their everyday lives. And when we looked 
at the stories of those people living with MS that we interviewed, we noticed three common experiences, which when looked at together, gave a picture of this complex process of self-concept change as experienced by these individuals. So this diagram shows that experience where some key life event would occur and cause a change to someone's everyday life. And this would then lead to that individual thinking about that and what that means to them, which would then result in some type of change in self-concept. So this first experience of changing life circumstances was described as defining moments in these individuals' lives. And one example of this changing life event was diagnosis. And this is a quote from a 26-year-old male who was discussing the most self-defining moments in his life so far. And he said to me, diagnosis was probably the biggest thing because it was such a shock. I felt like I was about to just melt away, like the person I was was gone now. And following a major life change, participants discussed what this meant for their self-concepts. And while MS caused a lot of pain for these participants, some spoke of how they used this to show their strength and determination, with this now becoming a defining thing in their self-concepts. And this quote is from a 58-year-old male who was telling me about how his MS had caused him lots of difficulties. However, he was now able to see that this had also made him a stronger and more determined person. And he said to me, I'm a survivor now, you know? That's it. You keep getting knocked down, you keep getting back up again. That's it. And the shift in thinking that occurred as a result of changes in day-to-day -day life was important for how these participants made sense of their new self-concepts. And a process of reprioritization was common, where participants spoke about devoting their time and energy to the most important parts of their lives and making them the most defining parts of their self-concepts. And this quote is from a 53-year-old woman who told me about her decision to leave work due to her deteriorating condition which allowed her to focus her energy on her children and her parental responsibilities. And she said to me, I'm like, I've got to look after myself a little bit more and not work full time, because obviously I'm not the person I want to be when I'm so focused on work. So what do we know so far? Well, self-concept change following MS diagnosis and throughout the disease course may be a common experience for those living with MS that can have wide-ranging impacts on adjustment. However, no two people that we interviewed and spoke to had the exact same experience of self-concept change. Therefore, it is likely a very personal and complicated experience that cannot be oversimplified. And as clinicians and researchers, it's important for us to understand how you may experience changes to your self-concept and the implications of that for your well-being. And we hope that this information will allow us to develop more targeted supports to be available for those who may be experiencing these changes to assist in the renegotiation and redefinition of self. So we're always looking for people to contribute to our work and help us build our understanding of the relevance of self-concept change for those living with MS. And we're about to launch a survey through the Australian MS Longitudinal Study that will investigate this topic further. So if you're a participant in that, you'll see that coming your way soon. Also, we're very keen to talk to anyone who's wanting to be involved with the interpretation of our study findings. So if you're keen, please come and have a chat with me. I'm over in the trade table area. And I would just like to thank all of the wonderful people that have um, contributed to this project, particularly my 
fabulous PhD supervisors, Dr. Cynthia Ronan and Dr. Christine Padgett, and the other wonderful people that have contributed to this project, as well as the 16 people living with MS that were kind enough to share their stories with us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Glenn's the rock star today. I'm the rock star. I'm just presenting Glenn's work today, which is about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the quality of life of people living with MS. Insights from a health economics perspective. <coughs> so our presentation contact, content today is um, essentially we're going to talk about what is health economics. We'll introduce our study, look at some of our research questions. Um, the methods or procedures that we use for our study, the things that make our study unique. We we'll also talk about who was the most impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, how did the COVID-19 pandemic affect these people, and some summary and suggestions from our work. So what is health economics? Well, health economics deals with scarcity and choice. This means that there are many demands on the healthcare dollar. Health economic studies help decision makers choose where health care dollars should be spent and Des touched on that concept in his introduction. So this includes examining how decisions impact people's quality of life. So health economists are interested in, in measuring quality of life and it helps us decide or help decision makers decide between option A for example or option B. So quality of life surveys are one, of, are one of the tools that we use to study health economics. And these surveys help us measure potential improvements or reductions in quality of life. A quality of life survey was used in our recent study of how the COVID-19 pandemic affected the MS community. And this study and its results will be the main subject of the presentation today. So I'll just hand over to Glenn now. Thanks, Glenn. From July 7th to October 27th, 2020, people in Melbourne, Victoria experienced a lockdown. This lockdown greatly restricted travel and access to goods and services. Under straight stage three restrictions, which were in place from July 7th, people were required to stay at home unless undertaking essential activities such as working, caregiving, or buying groceries. The closure of various businesses and community services, including gymnasiums and restaurants, and a maximum of one hour per day for outside, outside exercise. On August 2nd, additional stage four restrictions were enacted, including an 8 p.m. to 5 a.m. curfew, a restriction on travel to within five kilometers of a person's home, and a maximum of two people per gathering. Restrictions were eased sequentially from September 13th. At the same time, the rest of Australia experienced relatively few restrictions. This was because very few cases of COVID-19 were being recorded outside of Victoria. As the lockdown was happening when our Australian Multiple Sclerosis Longitudinal Study Survey went out, we were able to look at the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown on people with MS. We had several research questions. First, were people with MS in lockdown harmed more by the COVID-19 pandemic than people with MS out of lockdown? Second, how much harm was done to these groups? Three, was this harm clinically meaningful? In other words, was the impact of the harm big enough that it was really important? And what parts of health were impacted most? A special COVID-19 survey was used to figure out which people with MS were harmed the most by the COVID-19 pandemic and how much harm they experienced. People who responded to the survey were given a score from zero to two. If you got a score of zero, you experienced no harm. If you got a score of one, you experienced slight harm. And if you got a score of two, you experienced significant harm. To measure how this harm affected quality of life, and if this harm was important, we use the Assessment Quality of Life Eight Dimensions Survey. The way this survey works is shown on the left. Simply put, 
It works by taking the answers to 35 questions and turning them into eight scores relating to different parts of quality of life, using math. In turn, these eight scores are used to make two super-dimensional scores, one for physical health and the other for psychological and social health. Finally, these super-dimensions are used to create a final score, which is a measure of overall well-being or overall quality of life. This overall score has a zero to one scale, where zero is equivalent to death and one is equivalent to full health. There are a few things which made our study special. Firstly, it is the only large study of how people with COVID, uh, sorry, how COVID-19 affected people with MS in Australia. In addition, it's the first study of its kind to use a specialized COVID-19 questionnaire, pictured on the right, and the highly effective AQUAL 8D survey. The study is also special because it used mathematical tools unique to economics. Harm scores were higher for people with MS who were in lockdown, which tells us that they were impacted most by the COVID-19 pandemic. This result is shown in the chart on the left. Moreover, people with MS who were younger had relapse onset MS or worse MS related disability also reported more harm. Notably, people with MS both in and outside of lockdown reported harm, which showed us that it wasn't necessary for people to be in lockdown, or people with MS, sorry, to be in lockdown to actually be affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. People with MS reporting slight and significant harm had quality of life scores lower than people with MS who did not report harm. Interestingly, quality of life scores were two times lower for people with MS who reported significant harm compared to those who reported slight harm. Crucially, the reductions in quality of life scores for both the slight and significant harm groups exceeded the threshold for importance, meaning that they were substantial and very much meaningful to the people experiencing those reductions in quality of life. Should have been on that slide, I think. Okay. Ah, right, sorry. We also found that people with MS who reported harm were about twice as likely to experience an important reduction in their quality of life during the COVID-19 pandemic. In addition, about 44% of survey respondents said that they experienced substantial harm due to the COVID-19 pandemic. As a result, and as is shown in the pie chart, Harm due to the COVID-19 pandemic was widespread throughout the MS community. In addition to survey data, we also collected written statements from our survey respondents. These statements included responses to the question, would you like to provide any other information about your physical or emotional circumstances regarding the COVID-19 pandemic? Together with survey data, these statements helped us figure out that emotional well-being and keeping up with self-care activities, like eating well and exercising, were the areas of health people with MS felt were most impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Our study found that many people with MS were harmed by the COVID-19 pandemic and lockdowns. We also found that the level of harm inflicted passed the threshold for importance and that the most affected areas of health were emotional well-being and self-care activities. To reduce the harm experienced by people with MS during pandemics, we rec uh, during both the current pandemic and future pandemics, sorry, we suggest the expansion of both remote and telehealth services. Overall, we think our findings will raise awareness as to the impact of pandemics on people with MS. In turn, we plan that this awareness will cause proactive action Now, as I mentioned earlier, the respondents to the AMSLS are where we got the data from for this particular study. And so I give a special thanks to them for their participation. Without their involvement, this study would not have been possible. Your answers to the AMSLS for this study and for others help us greatly because it allows us to advise decision makers um, about the resourcing needs of people living with MS. 
We hope that you will continue to answer our surveys so we can continue to produce quality research. And of course, I didn't do this by myself. I have a list of co-authors on the board. Importantly, funding for this study came from the Tasmanian College of Health and Medicine and Multiple Sclerosis Australia. And as I mentioned, MSLS participants and of course their supporters were fundamental to this study, as was the MS Con uh, Consumer and Community Reference Committee. And of course, as always, we thank the AMSLS um, data administrators, Hilary Waugh, Carol Hurst, and Kirsty Hawkes for the wonderful work that they do. Thank you for listening. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. Um, I'll be talking about my PhD research, which is looking at uh, changes in cognition over time in MS. I was hoping to actually be able to share the results of a study with you all today, but unfortunately we've had some delays processing um, the biological samples that we collected as part of that study, so we haven't yet been able to analyse that data. Um, so instead I'm going to talk a bit about why we decided to do the study, uh, what we did, and what we expect that we might find when we do get to analysing the information that we've collected. Okay, so firstly, what is cognition? Well, really, this is a word that summarises the collection of mental processes that are involved in thinking, learning and remembering. Um, for example, in the context of a work environment, cognition could involve things like paying attention in a meeting to what your manager is saying to you and your colleagues, or it might be how quickly you can process information in your mind to get your work tasks done, or it could be using problem solving to figure out how you're going to manage your workload for the day so that you can get everything done. And it could also be remembering what tasks you did yesterday and maybe you don't need to do again today. And these processes are important, uh, not just for work, but because we rely on them to function efficiently and effectively in our everyday lives too. So we know that between 40 and 65% of people living with MS experience difficulties with their cognition. In the clinic and in research, this is often broadly referred to as cognitive dysfunction to describe varying levels of cognitive difficulties. These difficulties can contribute to a reduced health-related quality of life, largely because they can just make everyday life more difficult. So experiencing cognitive difficulties could, for example, mean that a person needs to spend more energy focusing in order to follow what someone's saying during a conversation, or they may have to write lots of things down so that they can remember them. And the experience of cognitive difficulties can be measured in two main ways, either by questionnaires which ask about a person's experience of these difficulties, or by objective cognitive tests, which are often used in the clinic and in research studies. And some research has shown that for some people living with MS, the experience of cognitive dysfunction can be linked with damage to nerve cells and to MS progression. However, people living with MS can have very different experiences of cognitive difficulties and we don't yet have a really clear picture of the way that different processes that happen within the body in MS can contribute to these difficulties. We do know that a particular pathway in the body known as the canurinine pathway of tryptophan metabolism which produces key metabolites or substances that are necessary for essential processes, including brain and immune functioning, has been shown to have imbalances in MS. 
And what this means is that instead of producing a variety of metabolites in balance, in MS, kinurinine pathway metabolites that can contribute to nerve cell damage are, when they are present in larger concentrations are being made at the expense of those that can help to protect and repair nerve cells. So it makes sense that this pathway might be involved in some way in the experience of cognitive difficulties in MS. And some earlier work um, out of our lab, which was undertaken in 2016 to 2017 by um, one of my supervisors, Dr. Cynthia Honan and colleagues, was investigating this idea. And this study found that kinurinine pathway metabolites in blood samples of people living with MS were linked with cognitive functioning. And these links were different when compared to people without MS. So for this most recent study, we wanted to build on those findings to try and gain a better understanding of these links because it is possible that these links could be an important piece of the puzzle to help with a better understanding and management of cognitive difficulties for people living with MS. So the aims of this most recent study were to see if we would find the same links between the kinurinine pathway and cognitive difficulties several years later, and also to investigate if these links change in some way over time. So what did we do for the study? Well, firstly, um, we invited uh, people sorry, living with MS who had participated in the earlier study to participate in a follow-up study because collecting information from the same participants would mean we could look at the change in their kinurinine metabolites and cognitive function over a four to five year period. And we had a total of 27 people living with MS choose to participate in the follow-up. Um, and I do just want to mention here that we didn't follow up people without MS from the earlier study because we had found in that earlier study that there were unique links between the kinurinine pathway and cognition in people living with MS. And these unique links are what we wanted to explore further. So recruited participants were asked a series of questions to reconfirm their eligibility and then completed several uh, self-report questionnaires, both on cognition as well as other functional outcomes, including fatigue and participation in daily activities. Then within seven days of completing the questionnaires, participants attended a session at their local university campus to complete a series of cognitive tests and provided a blood sample immediately following cognitive testing for later analysis of the kinurinine pathway metabolites. So once the blood samples are finished being processed from the study and we have the kinurinine metabolite information for all the participants, We'll use scores on a key cognitive test from the earlier study to split participants into two groups based on whether they showed considerable cognitive difficulties at this first time point or not. And we will then use statistical modelling to allow us to examine the change over time between these two groups in cognitive test scores, other functional outcomes like fatigue and participation in daily activities, and the different kinurinine pathway metabolites. So this study is quite exploratory because there's limited research looking at the links between the kinurinine pathway and cognition, but what we expect to find is that difficulties with cognition and other functional outcomes will be linked with imbalances in kinurinine pathway metabolites, as was the case in the earlier study. And we also expect that the group of participants with considerable cognitive difficulties in the earlier study will have increased imbalances in kinurinine pathway metabolites after this four to five year period. 
and will not perform as well on the cognitive tests and other functional outcomes as the group who did not have considerable cognitive difficulties at baseline. So we wait to see what the analysis shows and what insights it might give us about whether and how the community pathway is related to changes in cognition over time in MS. And then the next step after that is going to be exploring in another study how the gut bacteria and the gut brain connection may affect the kinurinine pathway and cognitive functioning in MS, including whether probiotics might have some therapeutic role in the management of cognitive difficulties in relapsing ruminic MS. Um, if what I've talked about today interests you, there are plenty of opportunities for consumer involvement, um, including plain language review of study results for distribution and of participant documents for the upcoming study on the gut-brain connection, uh, as well as participation in that upcoming study. So please come and see me um, at the trade tables today, or if you see me around at lunch or afternoon, Tea, please come and have a chat. Um, I would like to thank all the participants for generously volunteering their time for the study, uh, as well as um, Dr. Cynthia Honan and the rest of my supervisory team and the wider project team for their input. Um, thanks also to Clifford Craig Foundation, MS Australia, and the Australian Government Research Training Program for funding. And thanks to all the wonderful contributors and funders for today's event. And thanks to all of you for your attention. Um, I wanted to talk to you today about the very uh, reason for this event, and this is about the, the importance of consumer uh, and community involvement in research. So it, what does consumer and community involvement in research look like? And we use that word um, involvement and engagement loosely and interchangeably. So really consumer and community involvement in research is we're talking about um, consumer and community reviewers and I think that's what Terry mentioned before about how to get involved with her research or to have somebody f living with MS or from the consumer um, from the community actually doing some uh, review of her plain language and um, summaries of her project. Um, another example of uh, consumer involvement is research buddies, uh, being part of an advisory group, a reference committee, a steering group, uh, do some research priority mapping and I know that MS Australia have done an extensive survey on research priority mapping from, from a large consumer sample. And also consumers being involved with research institutes at a strategic level, not, not just at a token level but actually being in the room with decision makers and putting forward their views. Um, so consumer and community involvement is about research being carried out with or by consumers and community members. It's not about it being done to them, about them or for them. The involvement is where consumer and community members work in partnership with research institutions and organisations and I'm really proud to see um, how that's forging ahead at the Menzies Institute. So if we look at some things that consumer and community involvement is not, it's, it's not about participation in clinical trials or studies or the gathering of data from people by completing surveys. It's not consultation or interaction between researchers and the community. Um, they're normally one-way conversations and they're things like research forums as today, we're sharing information with you. Um, presentations and information sessions that's not consumer involvement. And consumer involvement is not fundraising either, but what I want to point out, importantly, all those things are vitally important. 
and sometimes you can't have involvement without participation and engagement. And each have a role to play in the research agenda. So why is consumer and community involvement important? And, and why do we have consumers and community involved? They have a lived experience um, of what it's like to have MS or other health conditions. They provide researchers with an alternative view and a different way of looking at things. They help ensure that the research is relevant to the needs of consumers. They have a vested interest in turning the research findings into improved practices and outcomes and I think that's evident from a lot of the questions that are being asked today from some of the presentations, people want to know what the next steps are from that research and, and how is that um, going to be turned into meaningful impact for people living with MS. And I think this is really important for the researchers in the room, is that funders um, require genuine consumer and community involvement to be evident in funding submissions, and I think that's becoming more and more important. That wasn't Chris, was it? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just think this is a really important quote, and this is taken from um, some people that have been working with at the Western Australian Health Translation Network um, of why consumer community involvement is so important. And that's as key stakeholders, consumers have an inherent right to be involved in health and medical research and should be encouraged, supported and given opportunities to do so. I just want to talk a little bit about the uh, MS Research Flagship um, Consumer and Community Involvement Journey and it probably is at the stage we're move, moving from engagement into involvement. So we have a Consumer and Community Reference Committee um, at Menzies that was established in 2019. The committee has its own terms of reference that set out the scope and the objectives for um, the committee and also uh, the membership and importantly it, it reports through to the uh, flagship steering committee and it's required to demonstrate uh, what, what they've been doing in, in the area of consumer and community involvement. The membership of the committee has been expanded. We started off with 12 members and uh, last year was expanded to 18 members and that was in, uh, really due to lobbying from that committee and participation in strategic um, planning sessions where the committee is being in, uh, increasingly involved with um, the research work at, at Menzies and uh, was being asked to uh, yeah, have increasing involvement. So we needed to increase the, the membership of that committee. So what are some of the things that the committee has been involved in? The things like reviewing information sheets, consent forms and advertising materials for projects. The review plain language summaries for grant submissions. Reviewing research presentations for plain language content and accessible formatting. participating in online workshops and focus groups for the development of MS short courses, being guest panellists in Facebook Live conversations about MS, So we've had uh, input into strategic planning sessions, assisting with organising uh, Forums such as today's uh, event has had a lot of input from our Consumer and Community Reference Committee. Uh, they've been involved with media training um, and they've participated in providing feedback at um, 
students and early career researchers forums and actually providing, say, a um, plain language lens over some of the presentations. But importantly, you don't need to hear from me about what we've been doing. I think it's really important that you actually hear from somebody who is actually on that committee. So I'll ask Chris to come and talk about some of her reflections of being involved in the committee. Thank you, Fit. <coughs> so I have been a member of the Menzies Research Flagship Consumer and Community Reference Committee since its inception in two, September 2019. Last year I was appointed Deputy Chair of this committee. Since 2019, when the committee was first commenced, Menzies has demonstrated its commitment to including consumers in their research in many ways. They have sponsored two workshops, helping us develop skills in plain language communication, grant reviews and sharing research information. At the workshops we discussed our achievements, challenges and future opportunities. We have also participated in MS Student Mid-Career Research Researcher Symposiums, awarding a Consumer's Choice Award. As part of the committee, I've, I have met several researchers, heard about their projects, leading to a greater understanding of how funds raised or donated for MS are utilised and potentially have an impact on those of us living with MS and those yet to be diagnosed. The researchers ensure that research is relevant to the needs of the consumer, use the consumer as an alternative view, and understand the importance of the consumer's knowledge and experience of living with the disease. Since 2019, the committee has had had the privilege of hearing about a number of research projects being undertaken by researchers and reviewing documents to ensure plain language communication. These documents include patient information sheets, surveys and questionnaires, wording in event advertisements such as today, the flagship logo and short course modules. Something I have learned from being on the committee is the difficulty that researchers have in translating their research projects into consumer information and how the committee has had a valuable role in assisting them meeting this goal. I facilitate an MS peer support group in Hobart and we recently had a researcher, as we heard about, Ingrid, thank you, demonstrate two digital tools to us that she was seeking feedback on. There were several questions. And at the end of the demonstration, the researcher asked if there were any mem if any members would be interested in using the tools and providing some feedback. Three quarters of the group agreed to do so. The researcher was pleased to gain consumer feedback, as were the group pleased to be involved in, have input into the projects that were being undertaken. A win-win situation, consumer involvement. I feel very privileged and valued as part of this committee and would strongly encourage others to become involved as the outcomes of research projects impact on the management and treatment of MS and hopefully the researchers work working in partnership with us will advance progress into identification of a cure. Thank you.